we were out with Mark Williams and uh, Mark had bumped a, a covey of, of Huns into a, a stubble field and uh, asked if we wanted to fly them. And we, so we, we pulled, uh, Patty Thompson was flying uh, one and I was flying the other and uh, we, we, we pulled them out. And as is our methods here anyway, we want to get those birds in the air as quickly as possible and pin, pin the Huns. So the birds came out, they already had transmitters on, hoods came off, the birds were in the air flying as a cast. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back for another episode of the Falconry Toll Podcast and hope you all have been enjoying the uh, Dachshund and Canada series so far. And this is the second episode that I'm bringing you all from the Canada series. But before we get started, I have to give a quick shout out to the the people who support the podcast being Bobby Agacrafts out of Poland. If you haven't ever had a chance to check out his stuff yet, I highly recommend you do so. You've heard me promote many, many times the amazing products that he puts out. All really nice handcrafted stuff. And whether you're in the market for potentially some new anklets, some jesses, whatever the case may be, it's definitely worth checking out. So if you haven't yet, his contact information is on our website at falconretold.com, or you can send him a message at Bobby Yaga Goshawk on Instagram. And if you're in the market for a new potential hunting partner for the upcoming 2024 season, then keep Seth Roy from North Mountain Goshawks in mind. He produces some really nice quality goshawks, and especially if you might be in the market for a parent reared one, he uh, produces some really nice game hawks. So, I've seen many of them fly in person, and everyone that I've seen fly, some of his hawks have been pretty happy. So, hit him up. Get on the list for the next season. Get on the website at northmountaingoshawks.com. Fill out that information form there on the uh, homepage or send them a message on Facebook. Tell them we sent you and get your name on the list for a new hunting partner for next season. And so, as I stated before, the Canada series continues on here with another fairly well-known name from Canada being Lynn Oliphant. Most of you might know him from being the author of Developing the Modern Game Hawk, The Four-Week Window, and Other Natural Approaches. It's definitely a good read if you've never read it before. It's a lot of good information in there, but I had a chance to discuss that book and some of the principles behind it with Lynn during this conversation, along with uh, the other usual topics. So let's go ahead and jump into this second episode of the series featuring different falconers from Canada with Lynn Oliphant. Here we go. All right, man. Well, like I said, it's good to finally meet your acquaintance. I know we've talked a couple times on the phone and you were, uh, you know, initially supposed to come down and, and do a talk, you know, for us in Indiana a couple years ago and everything, but um, it didn't work out because of weather and, and other catastrophic things back in, what was it, 2020? That, yeah, that'd be my guess. Yeah. Before COVID anyway. Yeah. Just yeah. Before COVID. Yeah. Right, yeah, it was just before that, and yeah, we won't go into the evil C word too much, uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was pretty bad weather around that time. It was we were getting some pretty bad freezing, um, a lot of a lot of ice and stuff up north. So I, I think we were at minus forty five or something centigrade. So yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. How how is it up there on average weather wise? You're in you're in Saskatoon, right? Right. I mean. Uh, I mean, right now we're in an, we just came out of a minus 20 spring. It set, seemed like spring was never going to come in, uh, you know, a little over a week ago, we still had snow uh, up to my knees. And then all of a sudden right now it's, uh, uh, yesterday was plus 26 centigrade, which I'm guessing is, uh, whoo, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. Mm. Yeah, that's a big difference. (laughs) Huge swings. Yeah. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought Midwest weather down here in the States was was bipolar. I that sounds even worse way up there. It yeah, it it can uh, it can vary drastically within 24 hours. 
Yeah, we've had plenty of plenty of weeks where we've gone from twenty or thirty degrees, and then two days later it's sixty or seventy. But yeah, I mean that happens quite a quite a bit during the spring here. But yeah, I I, I always find it interesting to hear the differences between where people live, like the similarities and the differences. So yeah, see, in terms of our hawking, uh, uh, we try to get an early start. Uh, our upland season actually starts on the fifteenth of August, uh, and um, uh, duck opens up first of September, but uh, usually by the end of October, at the latest uh, early November, uh, we've got freeze up, right? All the ponds are frozen, all the ducks are gone, and we're down to uh, uh, just our local upland populations, primarily uh, sharp tailed grouse and Hungarian partridge. Okay. So have you lived in that area the majority of your life then, or have you kind of been around? Well, uh, I guess now for the majority of my life, but I was born uh, in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, grew up uh, uh, just north of the uh, city boundaries uh, of De- Detroit uh, in uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, which at that time, if I would have known uh, what I know now, instead of chasing cottontails around with bow and arrow, I would have had a red-tailed hawk. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, I've I've been... I don't know. I've kind of lived briefly up in and around Michigan. I did a, a, a contract a couple years ago up in uh, Battle Creek. So I'm kind of somewhat familiar with that area and, and um, Kalamazoo and, you know, that that part of Michigan. But I've not really been many other places. So I don't like I said, I don't really know what a whole lot other parts of the state are like. I know some parts of it are pretty, but uh, how, how long? So how long of your childhood then were you were you there? I mean, before you started moving? Okay, well, I mean, I was born in 42, so uh, <clears throat> I stayed there until, I'm guessing, mid-60s. Uh, and during that time, I mean, it was an incredible place. I mean, lots of cottontail rabbits. Pheasants were phenomenal uh, during those years. Uh, at the opening of Pheasant Day, the gunners would kind of line up along the road and try to stay 10 feet apart and then walk into the field on opening day. Uh, and pheasants were everywhere. Uh, so uh, probably the Michigan that you uh, know is quite different from the one that I knew then. But then I, you know, I moved out to uh, uh, Seattle, Washington, to uh, uh, do my doctorate in zoology there, uh, and spent, uh, I guess, four or five years there before coming to Saskatoon. Okay. So I mean, you said that. You know, it, it had you known better or had you known any differently, you would have probably had a, a red tail on on your fist instead of a, you know, a bow and arrow and, and whatnot. But so, I mean, how, how early then or were you still in Michigan or were you uh, a little bit in your later years or college years before you started getting into into falconry then? Yeah, it was uh, when I was in Seattle. Uh, I mean, I dreamed of of uh, actually getting a goshawk. Uh, I, I had uh uh, a beagle that uh, I used for hunting with bow and arrow. And uh, I dreamed of having uh, a goshawk. I'd read by that time White's book on the goshawk and and the Craighead's book on hawks, owls, and wildlife. So I was aware of falconry, but had no contact with any falconers. So it wasn't until I moved to Seattle uh, that I trapped my first uh, uh, passage kestrels and uh, flew a couple of them while I was there essentially just to the lure and, um, and and learned a little bit about the basics of falconry. How many years did you spend like postgraduate or, you know, in college and stuff before you, you know, decided to really start feeling like you could pursue all of that then? I know everybody's journey is kind of different into that, but I mean, about what age were you before you were able to really kind of start seriously getting into it and making it more of a habitual thing in your life? Yeah, well, I would have been in my, uh, I guess, my late 20s, uh, well, very late 20s. Uh, uh, when I came to Saskatoon in 1971, I, I made contact with with a group of falconers here. Uh, uh, Bob Rafuse had just moved out from uh, uh, Alberta, and uh, uh, then a whole crew uh, uh, came out from B.C. and relocated here in Saskatoon. So uh, that's 
essentially uh, the early 70s was when I really got started into uh, serious falconry. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I mean, as far as, you know, spurring your interest in it and everything, I mean, was there one of the books that you read or was there an experience whenever you were younger? I mean, you you said you were kind of dreaming about getting into it, you know, a large part of your life before you actually did get into it. I mean, about what age did you even discover it was a it was a thing? Well, it was probably when I was in grade five. Uh, I I spent much of my time, like I said, uh, out, out out in the woods kicking around, and uh, I came upon the uh, what I now understand was probably just a starving, immature, red-shouldered hawk. And I picked it up, brought it home, and with a a friend of mine, we. Uh, uh, managed to revive it, uh, and and that was just through luck. Uh, my fifth grade teacher had raised uh, chickens, and he said, well, maybe it's got coccidiosis, and I've got this medication, and it was a water medication. So we re- rehydrated it. I don't think the medication did anything, but rehydrating the bird was amazing, and then uh, it started eating, and uh, uh, at that point, I, I knew nothing about falconry, hadn't read White's book about the goshawk or, or the Craighead's books. And, um, uh, but I did get the bird to, uh, you know, feed on the fist and had no jesses on it, but it would stay on the fist. And I actually uh, took it into my grade five class and, and, uh, gave a talk about, uh, how important birds of prey were in, in the natural ecology of, uh, of the world. And, uh, uh, was soon after that, that the bird, uh, left my fist and uh, returned to the wild. <laughs> but that was, that was my defining moment, I think, in terms of my interest in birds of prey. And, and it hasn't uh, 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 taken its hooks out of me since. Yeah, that's interesting. So your, uh, your inclination to kind of educate and, you know, make others aware then started that early age or grade grade five then that's interesting shortly after that then i mean i mean that was that the only bird that you had then or had any experience with up in that point falconry or, or otherwise until you know you ended up in in college and stuff then or was there any anything else else experience wise that you had between those times no, not not with birds of prey. I mean, I I, I you know kept everything from uh, salamanders and snakes and turtles to uh, uh, you know raising uh, baby birds. Uh, I, I learned a lot by by raising a uh, an orphan starling uh, through to fledging and whatnot. It was almost like a I did a tame hack essentially with this starling out in the yard and uh, until it was. Uh, uh, killed by the neighbor's cat. Uh, uh, I learned a, a lot from that starling, actually. <laughs> and it was then that you realized that that outdoor cats weren't very good for for ecological effects either. Then, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's cool. Well, yeah. I mean, everybody, like I said, has has different treks in getting into it and discovering it being falconry of course uh but i mean so it sounded like i mean from an early stage regardless then i mean you pretty much knew that you wanted your kind of life and career and stuff to be oriented then around biology and and wildlife then it sounds like is that correct oh for sure yeah 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 well cool so i mean whenever you kind of then moved to saskatoon and kind of got acquainted with all the falconers that you met kind of around there and and stuff i mean was there Anybody else that kind of became kind of a mentor for you or were you completely just self-educated, self-taught and trial and error as far as what you learned getting into the sport? Or were there was there anybody in particular that that kind of helped really teach you the ropes and a lot of the stuff? Well, certainly uh, uh, Bob Rafuse was my early mentor. Uh, as soon as I came to uh, Saskatoon and had, had made contact with him. And then this group moved in, actually into uh, into the house next door uh, where I was uh, uh, living, uh, uh, and I guess that was a, a bit later on. Uh, um, we were all floundering at the time. Uh, Patty Thompson uh, 
had had some experience flying a, a red tail and uh, 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 others had had uh, experience flying prairie falcons and, and whatnot. Uh, but we were all basically f floundering uh, uh, on our own. Uh, Bob Rafus and uh, another fellow from uh, Saskatchewan uh, had uh, had some early experience trying to breed prairie falcons, you know, successfully uh, in a small shed that uh, uh, they had. Um, but in terms of actually hunting, uh, everybody was still floundering, I thought, in, in, in the early 70s. Uh, uh, you know, the early aspects of falconry in North America were, were a lot more about uh, flying the birds to the lure and, uh, and not actually hunting them very often. Yeah, that was going to be my next question for you is, I mean, what, what you typically read in in the history books and or, you know, any kind of um, documented history about falconry in North America in those early days is kind of what you just described. And, you know, some of the older falconers, too, I've heard the same from a lot of them as well. But, I mean, was there anybody from around that area then that, you know, was actually becoming more successful or more prevalent that people were kind of taking notice of, or was it everybody is still kind of doing their own thing? Well, I, mean, I, I think everybody uh, in the group in, in kind of the uh, early seventies uh, to uh, late seventies, uh, we all floundered together. It wasn't like uh, somebody had a, you know, uh, an edge on, on anybody else. Uh, we were mainly flying, long wings, although the first bird that I had when I came here was a, a, a hand-me-down dark phase ferruginous hawk. And again, that, that bird kind of taught me the basics of, of actually getting out into the field and attempting to hunt. Uh, but up around Saskatoon wasn't a great place for a ferruginous hawk. Most of the rabbits we had were snowshoe hare, and they were in pretty heavy cover and ferruginous uh, wasn't interested in going into any heavy cover like a red tail is. And uh, uh, it wasn't until the next year that uh, Bob Rafew sent me a, a uh, confiscated prairie falcon that uh, somebody had taken from, from an Irie and uh, uh, had been raised as an imprint. I got it when it was kind of a, a big downy. And that, that started out... Uh, my successful career. Uh, most of us at that point in time were pursuing ducks. We didn't even consider trying to catch sharp tail or grouse in, in those early years. If we were successful with ducks, we were very happy. And uh, prairie falcon I had was hard to enter the ducks. I remember the first duck it caught was a, a green winged teal in a small pond that uh, my German wire haired pointer and I both waded into. Uh, trying to uh, unsuccessfully get it to flush, I finally managed to uh, pick it up and I threw it into my bird's feet as she flew over. And amazingly, uh, from then on, uh, she became a, uh, better and better at, at hawking ducks. And uh, I flew her for a number of seasons then uh, 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 where we, we caught ducks on a, on a regular basis. So that was my first movement into actually hunting so that was the on switch for the bird you kind of more or less tossing it to where she could catch it then exactly That's, yeah well i mean i guess it's not really a whole lot different than using a a launcher or or throwing pigeons or anything else in the grand scheme of things i guess <laughs> yeah i i think that's interesting that you said that your first bird like i i i can only imagine what interesting scenario, like basically learning with the ferruginous probably was for you like that. It would be a heck of a first bird, I would think. Yeah, it, it was very frustrating. I mean, it was it was uh, a well-trained bird. Jim Crocius had trained it to come to the fist and, and whatnot. Uh, easy bird to handle that way. Uh, but the only actual pursuit flight that I ever got with it was on a cock pheasant that I'd spotted down in a ditch and there was a kind of a 
hill that rose up behind it. And I got up on top of the hill, had another fellow flush the cock pheasant and, and um, the fruits chased it off uh, in, until it went into cover. And then of course broke off and wasn't interested in pursuing anymore. But, uh, mm-hmm. but I, I certainly learned an awful lot just as I did with the uh, prairie falcon, both about hunting and uh, about breeding. I mean, it was an imprint. Uh, my muse at the time was four feet by four feet by six feet. I had to crawl in on my hands and knees to get into the muse with the bird. Didn't have a double door. Uh, the The prairie falcon was uh, an unusual imprint. It was uh, what I would call a, a bad imprint uh, uh, outside the muse. But inside the muse would would court would turn into a courting female, uh, and six inches made all the difference. Six inches out of the muse, and it was, you know, it could hang and bait and scream and bite. Uh, six inches into the muse, all of a sudden it was e chipping and courting, and I put a a nest ledge in there and was sitting there when it laid its first egg. It laid a clutch of nine eggs probably in its either second or third year. Uh, uh, so that got me interested in the potential for, for captive breeding. Isn't that funny how they develop those quirks? You know, like, it, like you said, just, you, it, it was just like enough being inside the Mew that it kind of triggered, you know, that courting response as opposed to, you know, that the more wild response. I mean, that's, that's, it's amazing how, how yeah. quirky they are. Exactly. I mean, and, and I've, you know, there have been so many situations like that where uh, you have to shake your head as to what's going on and try to figure out why is this bird acting like it is. Uh, and it's a learning process. And I've come to a number of conclusions. Maybe maybe none of them are right, but <laughs> uh, uh, I've come to uh believe there's at least the possibility that they're right. But usually it's a, a matter of having a single case, right? Uh, uh, you don't have uh, a big sample size. A sample size of one doesn't really give you any definitive uh, answer usually. It just uh, kind of tweaks your your mind into a, a questioning mode. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the ultimate litmus test is being able to repeat it several times and you'll get the same result and under the, with the same circumstances and kind of reinforce your, your theory. But, but yeah, it seems like we don't always have the luxury of time in regards to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to being able to repeat and kind of develop that sample size, so to speak. Yeah. It'd be great to have a, you know, 50 birds that you could put into, you know, maybe, two or three different groups and handle differently and, and see if you could come to a conclusion then. Well, sure. And, and even then it's still not going to be a hundred percent foolproof because every bird's different also. And they have different, you know, quirky responses to different aspects of their personality and, and, uh, and everything else too. But I mean, we do our best and unfortunately we, I mean, we only, live so long and and only have so much time <laughs> so exactly and my time's running out you know <laughs> so uh, i've got to uh you know gar- garner as many ideas as, as i can uh, in the few years i've got remaining well i mean that's all we can do doesn't matter if we're 40 80 15 you know i mean we we always think that we have this luxury of time but it always goes so fast, unfortunately. Exactly. And you just wait till you hit 80. It'll rip. Lynn, I, I don't I don't have any delusions of grandeur that I'm gonna hit sixty five to seventy, let alone eighty. You know, so the with the rate I'm I'm going some of the times. But uh but anyway, I yeah, I mean we it depends on who we are. Sometimes we burn the candle at both ends for a little too long, but uh, you know. It is what it is. But I mean, it sounds like, though, I mean, your early years, you had some very, you know, like diverse uh, bits of experiences. I mean, and uh, since you are from that generation that didn't really have the mentorship in place, uh, the system in place from the very beginning, 
you know, I mean, I, I, I always like talking to guys like you because you guys all have these just so widely varying, you know, just different aspects of experience, you know, for your, from your initial kind of introduction into the sport and everything, you know, I mean, it, it, y'all seem to have so many different, you know, like angles, you know, and, and they're always unique angles, you know, I mean, any more is in North America, you know, as you know, especially in the U S you know, you got the apprenticeship system. Most people, you know, learn by starting with a red tail, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot more streamlined now, of course, than it used to be. So, I mean, it sounds like you, you know, you're, you're no exception as, as far as that, you know, that, you know, older generation that, that just, like I said, you just kind of learned however you could. Yeah. And, and, and we all, all floundered together and learned from each other's mistakes, as opposed mm-hmm. to having somebody who says, well, you know, this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have anybody in that situation. Everybody had a little bit of experience and, uh, uh, we shared our experiences, and uh, I mean, I was one of the first ones here that actually uh, started uh, hawking upland game birds uh, rather than just ducks. Which uh, hawking uplands is, is certainly uh, more difficult in many ways. Uh, um, uh, you know, requires you know more trained dog work and, and whatnot to be successful, and. Uh, uh, in the early 70s here, we we had an unbelievable situation where our upland game population was several times what it is now. Uh, both sharp-tailed grouse and Hungarian partridge were everywhere. And it was a great uh, situation to be in when when you're learning because you you can go out and repeat, repeat, and repeat until until you're successful and kind of work out. You know, why did that work versus what I was doing before? Well, sure. And not only for you, but also for your bird. You know, exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. And I mean, repetition is the mother of learning for it seems to be pretty much every creature on Earth <laughs> and not just us. So exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, I yeah, it's I, I can only imagine how that process would have been sped up back in the day or, you know, in the era where there was so much more land and so much more game and, you know, the red, like readily available access to slips and the quantity of slips was there so much more than today. I mean, I I know there's got to be a lot more people probably spinning their wheels, even with mentorship and guidance now, just because it's so much harder to find slips now than it used to be. Yeah. And we're still fortunate here in Saskatchewan. I mean, we have uh, abundant quarry still, uh, especially for for long wings. Uh, And, uh, you know, that uh, it it makes it immensely uh, uh, easier to uh, to get a bird started if you've got that regular quarry. Yeah, I'm I'm sure. And I mean, that's kind of like the the falconry rule of thumb is, you know, fly whatever bird you have available quarry for it. You know, I mean, whatever species that might be and, and so on and so forth. But, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I just out of curiosity though, I mean, do you think that, I mean, I'm always interested to find this out from, from people that started in your era as well. But I mean, do you think, I mean, given if you had the option to go back and, like the system that is currently in place today was in place back whenever you initially got into it and the information was more readily available. I mean, would you have preferred learning that way or would you have preferred to kind of learn how you learned with basically a group of people that were kind of, you know, just feeling their way through it together? I mean, what, what, what what would your preference be for that? You think? Well, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that there'd be a, a preference, uh, it would have eliminated uh, 99% of the frustration <laughs> of the early years, yeah. which would have been great. Uh, and you could have pr- produced, you know, uh, uh, great game hawks from virtually all the birds that, that you came in, in contact with, um, uh, which certainly wasn't the case, you know, back in the, back in the early days. 
um, uh, I've often thought that, you know, I'd give anything knowing what I know today about how to handle birds and how they develop and uh, how we can interact with that development uh, to go back to Saskatchewan in the 1970s and 80s with the game populations we had, it, it would be like heaven. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the <laughs> hindsight is always 2020, as they say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. How many years were you practicing falconry then before you got inspired to, I don't know, start writing or kind of passing on things that, that you had learned? And, you know, how did that kind of develop and transition then to you kind of being inspired to write your, your book about, you know, the, the, your, the learning window and all that? Well, that, that took a lot longer than it should have. Uh, I'm, I'm a slow learner, I guess. Uh, it, it didn't, I mean, we were, we were starting to do hacks, uh, because of, of the, um, uh, the use of the hack in, in reintroducing the peregrine. We were doing hacks with, uh, prairie falcons and merlins and, uh, and very quickly, uh, peregrines when we were producing them. Uh, so I, I learned a lot from these hacks. Most of them were, were wild hacks at, at that time with the peregrines. Uh, so we had year after year of releasing peregrines and uh, uh, looking after the, the hack and watching the birds develop. Uh, but it seemed it, it was a slow evolution in, in terms of how I changed my methodology in terms of how I handled the own, my own birds that I used for falconry uh, just seemed to take forever. Uh, it started out, um, let me think, uh, started out mainly with, with wild hacked peregrines. Um, we had a wonderful relationship with the game department in those days. And uh, we had permits uh, uh, to retrap hacked peregrines, captive red birds that were being released for reintroduction, had permits to recapture them and fly them for one or two years uh, before releasing them again to the, the wild. So I had a lot of experience with, with, uh, with wild hacked uh, peregrines, uh, as well as other species. I mean, at the same time, we were... We were um, uh, that we're doing wild releases with with peregrines. We were doing uh, tame hacks with with hybrid jur peregrines and and full jurs. Uh, uh, so there was some overlap there, but it, I mean, I I really didn't formulate what I was doing in terms of uh, uh, of uh, of actually being able to write about it until you know uh, 20 years ago and and that's when i first finally thought that uh well i was i was stimulated by ed pitcher's book the flying of falcons and uh uh and very much a affected by that um uh, and uh and by my, my by my experience then with uh tame hacking because by that time we were we would shifted from wild hacking of peregrines to captive breeding and tame hacking. We weren't doing any more releases and we were producing birds for falconry and using a, a tame hack then. And so it was that combination of, uh, of that experience plus reading Ed Pitcher's book that uh, stimulated me to uh, actually, you know, put down in written form what, what we'd been doing and, and clarifying in my own mind why I thought it worked as well as it did. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, basically between being inspired by another written source, plus, you know, just figuring out then how to compile and, and put everything into a, a compilation of, of sets of writing, then, you know, as far as I me, mean, how long of, of a time frame overall do you think it was? And I know you said it took you, longer than what you thought it should 
But I mean, how how long do you think you developed your method and, you know, like had enough experience with as many different birds using that method? Do you think it was before you were able to kind of, I don't know, develop a way to put that in writing then? Like about how long do you think that process was? About how many years? 30 to 40 years and uh, close to uh, experience with 150 to 200 large falcons. So that was uh, <laughs> that was the sample size then that, that you felt <laughs> that, that you needed to be able to. <laughs> Pretty much so, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Well, that is, like I said, everybody's standard is different, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you, you know, I would, I would much rather have someone have the much higher sample size, you know, like, you know, like yours, than come to find out that someone, you know, decided to write a book with, you know, just like a handful or even less, you know, like it's always, it's always good to know exactly how much goes into, you know, the facilitation of a book like, like yours, you know, yeah. or a method like yours. Yeah. Well, I'm always amazed when, when I read an account of somebody who is espousing a method of training or flying a bird, uh, and then you find out they've only, you know, they've only been flying birds for three years. Sure. Well, boy, uh, either they're fast learners or I'm a very slow learner because after three years of flying a bird, I, you know, all I had was questions. I, I didn't have any answers. But for me, the, the defining, maybe the defining uh, sentence in Ed Pitcher's book was this, and I'll, I'll read it to you. The idea that a falcon or any bird of prey courses through a developmental process has eluded most of the falconry literature. And that was why I thought <clears throat> I needed to put this down in, in print. Because, uh, I mean, what we were doing was really vastly different in, in many ways. It wasn't about training. It was allowing uh, the developmental process of, of a bird of prey to come through naturally at the time uh, that it's genetically programmed to do. Yeah, and I can see then why you would want to have so many different birds, you know, go through that because I can understand how difficult initially, you know, you would, it would be to kind of process exactly when those timeframes were, you know I mean? Like it, you, it would have to take a lot of observation to figure out, okay, after week one, they're kind of learning this, or after week two, they're, they're kind of genetically predisposed to be wanting to learn this or going through this development. And I can, I can totally see why and respect why you would want to have hundreds of birds <laughs> or, you know, well, well over that many, you know, a, a huge number of birds to go through that. Yeah. And, and very often uh, what would happen is uh, we'd get kind of an idea and change one thing the next year, just one thing in, in the, in the process that we were using. Uh, for example, what we used to, when we started out with the, uh, uh, using captive bred birds, uh, and tame hacking them and using the four week window approach was, uh, we would pull the birds from the parents, uh, when they were about a week before fledging. So we'd go up, we'd, We'd haul down the uh, parents. I mean, that, that maybe that was one of the first things we did. We learned we needed to contain those parents so they were not cacking uh, in anger when we were pulling the young. That in introduces fear right off the bat. The adults are telling me as a young bird that there's danger coming in. All of a sudden, I arise up uh, over the nest ledge and grab one. Not a good way to start. So we always... Uh, uh, grab the adults, box them up <clears throat> so they weren't making any noise before we took the young birds. But then typically we took the young birds and, uh, you know, we we either socked them or, or wrapped them up and we immediately put on their dresses and whatnot, again, introducing a lot of fear at that stage. 
So then uh, finally, after a decade of doing that, and I had the idea, maybe that's not the time to put on dresses and manhandle the bird as soon as you've grabbed it, right? It's again, a bad uh, start. And as Ed Pitcher points out, uh, there are no second first impressions and it's a bad first impression. So we shifted over to just gently picking up a bird, putting it in a, in a box and we didn't touch it then until it was tame enough to put the dresses on without any issues whatsoever. That reduced the time we needed to address the fear factor from three or four days down to 24 hours. Just that one change. And so uh, that was maybe one of the best examples we had of, you know, uh, you know, having had dozens of years doing it one way and then changing that one thing and nothing else and seeing the results of that, we could come to the conclusion, yeah, this was a good move. Well, right. a, a good addition to uh, our methodology of, of, of dealing with these birds. Well, and, and then how many, conversely then, how many things that you tried changing, then did you decide, okay, that really wasn't <laughs> a good a good idea to change that. Uh, we need to go back to the way we were doing it or try a, a different approach then. How many of those things did you run into? I can only remember one, actually. Um, uh not that long ago, I had the uh, idea that maybe the the best way of, of doing this is to have our young birds raised by imprints that show no fear factor with human appearance whatsoever. So I had two peregrines that I put with a uh, male juror peregrine imprint that did a great job raising and uh i would just nonchalantly go in for a very short period of time hand the uh, the surrogate parent uh, a quail he'd go and feed the young i'd stand back or leave uh, and i thought this is going to be great because when it's time to pull these birds they're going to be totally unafraid of me and i'm going to be able to go in there and and uh Maybe don't even have to put them in a box. I just get, get the parent out of there and I can start feeding them by forceps. And, and there is no fear factor. That didn't work. <laughs> it took, those birds were the strangest kind of partial imprint birds I've ever worked with. And uh, it was only the one sample size of two, but both those birds uh, acted fearful of almost everything they were fearful of i've never had birds that were fearful of the of the kite man you put up a kite and they left the hack area and wouldn't come back till the kite was down whereas other birds uh uh if you put up a kite with, with lure on it immediately went went to the lure they may have only been flying for two or three days and they immediately saw that lure and 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 went to the lure uh, so uh, I don't know still to this day exactly what was going on. But now uh, when we rear birds, we don't show them people until the, the time when we're going in to take them. Uh, and um, But then we handle them uh, very gently during that period and uh, get uh, real quick adaptation to uh, humans and dogs within 24 hours. And uh, at that point, we start working with them in terms of hooding, putting on the jesses. Once I can hood them, they'll sit on a perch and I just put the jesses on. There's no no manhandling. And uh, we found that to be, you know, one of the best uh, uh, differences in methodology that that uh, made a huge difference in, in our ease of uh, getting through that first week. Gotcha. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of good stuff in that book for sure. I mean, I've, I read it and, you know, one thing that I did wonder while I was reading it. And one thing that we kind of broached on briefly, whenever we talked the other day on the phone was, you know, I mean, how readily this could be applied to not just to, to long wings, but to species of hawks and, 
and um, you know, just other species of raptors. I mean, what are your thoughts on on that? Was was there anything that you think you would modify in your approach with uh, with those other species? Or well, see, I, I don't have any experience with uh, with other you know other than that one ferruginous hawk. All my experience has been with falcons, hmm. and uh, we understand now that falcons and uh, uh, the other species of birds of prey are probably not real closely related. Uh, and so I hate to uh, suggest that uh, it's easy to uh, adapt uh, the methods that we're using with falcons to other species, but it seems to be the case. I mean, certainly people like Mike McDermott working with exhibitors and, uh, uh, and, and other people uh, uh, have been able to uh, adapt a, a, a tame hack uh, kind of uh, time scale for for their training that seems to be very similar and seems to work very well for for other birds of prey other than falcons. Gotcha. Yeah, I just I was just curious if um I mean and and if you don't have much experience with you know your particular you know applying I mean I guess that would almost be kind of a a little bit of a a, a I don't. I wouldn't. I don't know if I would say challenge, but it would be kind of a an interesting process then to have some other people, you know, take your specific four week window application and see if, if it really does need modifying with some of the other species. I, and I know, you know, I mean, I've talked to Mike several times about, you know, the, the exhibitor, like the methods that he uses with exhibitors and things. And I've read, you know, his, his books as well and stuff. And, and I know that everybody ultimately will end up developing their own methodology and how they want to raise imprints, especially but it would be interesting to see just how, you know, your particular method and, and the timing of how everything plays out with the development process, you know, with, you know, your four week window and falcons would kind of translate over to some of the other species of, of hawks, though. It would yeah. be kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, the main one of the main differences I see right now is that most of the people uh, that are working with exhibitors uh uh, like to work with an imprint bird and then do a, a tame hack and, and, and that works out. Uh, I, I have no desire to, uh, to have an, an imprint bird as a falconry bird. I, I really like uh, uh, a bird that knows its species and doesn't want to socialize with me uh, unless I really press uh, the issue by over socializing with it. Uh, uh, I appreciate that kind of mentality. So I think that, you know, I, I always prefer the, the, the parent raised bird until one week before fledging so that they're, they are uh, self actualized as a falcon uh, rather than being confused uh, in terms of their sexual imprinting. Um, uh, but other than that, I, as far as I can see, the uh, the methodology would be very similar, I think. I got gotcha. you. Well, let's kind of transition then. I mean, like I said, I will um, you know, kind of end with how people can get your book and stuff here after a bit. But um, I kind of want to transition to getting you know a couple of, of stories from you then uh you know some of your favorite experiences with a with a particular bird that you've flown or a particular uh hunting experience that you've had anything that kind of comes to mind story-wise that uh that you would be willing to share I, I think one of the most interesting ones and and uh and perhaps helped bring me uh to the point where i was going to write the book is the story of of uh, a tearsel peregrine uh, named Tar that my wife flew as a falconry bird and his two sons um, uh, that were handled differently. So Tar was a bird uh, that was chamber raised, uh, was taken out uh, probably about the time it was hard penned and was a very slow bird to start. Uh, we typically start our birds by, you know, uh, when we're entering them, entering them to chucker. This Tiersel peregrine was not going to interact with a chucker. Uh, 
and we finally had to enter it uh, using a, a Caternix quail, right? That was the only thing it would take. It took, <clears throat> I'm not even sure if it was the first year or second year, it finally made its first wild kill, a duck. And uh, uh, slowly became a better and better falconry bird, but it took several years. By the time it was three or four years old, uh, uh, it had taken its first uh, uh, upland game uh, and, uh, and then became, uh, at that time, uh, the best sharp tail bird I'd, I'd ever had for falconry. I mean, my wife had, had trained it. My wife has infinite patience and, and did an excellent job at bringing this bird along, but it was very slow. Uh, we raised a, a number of young from, from that bird, but uh, the, the two that uh, I'll talk about are, uh, we, we call Tibber and Cole. Two, again, Tiersel peregrines from, uh, uh, from Tar. And those birds were handled pretty much the way that I now describe in in developing the modern game hawk, right? Uh, with the, the four week window hack. And those birds were amazing. I mean, uh, practically killing ducks on their first wild flights on a regular basis, being flown in a, in a cast. Uh, and uh, as immature birds, uh, we took them down to the falconry meet in, uh, uh, in Saskatchewan that I think was at Riverhurst then. Uh, and uh, uh, we were out with Mark Williams, and uh, 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 we Mark had bumped a, a covey of, of Huns off uh, uh, into a, a stubble field and uh, asked if we wanted to fly them. And we, so we, we pulled, uh, Patty Thompson was flying uh, one, and I was flying the other, and uh, we, we, we pulled them out, and... Uh, as is our methods here anyway, we want to get those birds in the air as quickly as possible and pin pin the Huns. So the birds came out, they already had transmitters on, hoods came off, the birds were in the air flying as a cast. They both went up nicely. Then I started working in with the dogs. Can't remember if we got a point or not, but we certainly flushed birds and uh, uh, both birds uh, uh, chased and uh, uh, Cole was uh, the one that was successful uh, on the hunt kill. And uh, so this is, this is now uh, early October of their first season, right? They'd already, between the two of them, they'd already killed a, a dozen or more uh, ducks as large as gadwalls. I can't remember if they killed any mallards by that time, but uh, had done well on ducks, had had made a few kills probably on Partridge. And uh, Mark Williams saw this. He says, I have to have that bird. <laughs> and so he, we sold him coal on the spot. <laughs> uh, and that became his first four week window bird that he was very happy with, right? Uh, so what I took as the difference is the difference in handling and opportunities between Tar, who became an excellent falconry bird in his third, fourth, and subsequent years. Uh, I think we were able to fly him until he was 12 or 14. He, uh, uh, and he had a stroke at that point in time and uh, just, you know, wasn't the, the same since. But uh, the length of time it took him to develop into a, a good falconry bird with a lot of patience and a lot of slips. If we didn't have the, the, the game population that we had, we, I don't think I could have ever turned him into a, a, a good bird or Rhonda couldn't have turned him into a, a, a good bird. But his two sons with a four week window, man, first year, they're good birds. <clears throat> A bird of prey has to be a good bird in its first year, or it starves to death. This is very true. I mean, as soon as it's independent, if it can't kill enough food, it's dead and is eliminated from the genetics. 
So they're all good birds genetically. And that just drove home to me. Same genetics. Well, not exactly same, but certainly the father was the same. And uh, uh, completely different developmental uh, rate uh, between, between his sons and himself. Uh, a, a big learning experience for me. And like I say, I think uh, was one of the things, again, that drove me to, to put down in, in print what I believe is the case that the difference is not in genetics. They're all good birds. It's not like Steve Shingren has got a line of birds that you can't touch, or we have a line of birds that nobody else can touch. It's about the opportunities presented at the right time. And I know Steve has a, a different approach, but but he pushes it, right? If he takes a, a bird that's been chamber raised and whatnot, he gets it back on the wing as quickly as he can and gets it entered as quickly as he can and uh, is very careful then with the development, ongoing development of that bird in its first year, you know, trying to fly difficult quarry like sage grouse are, uh, that he makes sure that it's successful and stops flying if the bird is uh, is uh, having uh, a lack of success as it goes into the season and is flying strong adults in, in, in the winter. And he'll build it up again the next year to build into uh, his thing. So he's he's got a method that works fantastically uh, for him. And I think misses that opportunity that, that we see in that four week window period. Uh, but he makes up for it in getting that bird in uh, on the wing as quickly as possible, entered as quickly as possible and killing birds that first year. If you go for a year or two and you've never made a wild kill with a falconry bird, you've got a bird that's going to take unbelievable effort and time and patience to continue to develop yeah i mean there's uh, we've discussed it many times with with other guests and and things but i mean there's definitely more than one ways to skin the falconry cat so to speak as far as getting birds going and and as we mentioned before i mean ultimately everybody kind of finds their way that they like doing things and is most comfortable because not everybody has infinite patience and in doing things one way versus another and and all that but it, you know, you can never have, well, I mean, I guess in some instances you, you could, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's never a bad thing to have lots of different sources of information at your disposal. So you can kind of figure out and make your own what you think will work for you. But, you know, it's always nice to have a very diverse amount of information to initially choose from, you know, as long as it's, you know, it, it, sometimes it takes a little while to figure out if it's valid or not, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but that's just part of falconry and, and part of our, our journey through it. So. Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty lazy. I like to do things <laughs> as easy as possible, quick as possible, and as uh, foolproof as possible. And so that's what I'm, that's where, where I'm headed. I figure for a four week window bird from the time it's pulled from the parents to the time uh, it's entered, I haven't spent much more than maybe 30 or 40 hours with total, total time. I don't want to, I don't want to sit with a bird on my fist for 24 hours, manning it, you know, constantly, uh, uh, keeping it from sleeping and what I can't do that. I don't have the patience. I don't have the time. Um, uh, I want to, I want to interact with that bird uh, in a very positive way uh, and a very easy way. Uh, and one that is pretty stress free for the bird as well uh, as much as I can. And, and so that's the direction I, I took. I have no, I have no desire to train uh, a passage exhibitor. I, I don't think I, I'm capable of it. I'm not a good enough falconer. I'll, I'll just say it, right? I'm not a good enough falconer. I don't have the patience. I don't have the time or interest to deal with a bird that's not happy with me. 
Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's always funny to me to hear other people's experiences, especially the ones that will, you know, for whatever reason, have a, a quick amount of success with, say, like a passage coupe or something. And you just wonder, I mean, did you really hit the lottery or did you just, you know, <laughs> or what, what's what's the secret? Like I said, some people just for whatever reason have more patience, I think, with certain species. I just think and I've, I've talked about this many times. I just think that some people just have personalities that are more wired to just tolerate certain species more than others too. I, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I mean, I'm kind of like you. I mean, there's certain things that, that I don't have as much patience for as others as well, but you know, I mean, some people just for whatever reason I can, can deal with certain things better than, than others. I guess it's just, like you said, a personality thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, I'm, uh, like you say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a great falconer, um, uh, so I work with what I think is the easiest falconry bird to work with, and for me, that's a tiersel peregrine. Mm. Attitude, ability, everything else uh, is perfect for falconry, and uh, uh, so I choose it over uh, over the others. And I'm in an area where there's abundant game for for uh, a tiersel peregrine, uh, and it can take quarry pretty much up to the, the largest quarry that, that we've got here, other than I wouldn't fly it on geese, uh, but uh, drake mallards, no problem. Uh, uh, you know, adult uh, sharp-tailed grouse, I wouldn't say no problem. They, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult flight for them, but... Uh, uh, I had a short season last year with uh, with Inca, my my current Tiersel Peregrine, uh, who was in his fifth season, and uh, he killed fourteen sharp tails and had at least that many fantastic flights uh, where he made contact, but we we didn't didn't kill. Yeah. Got feathers, <laughs> <laughs> which is for me just as good as as a kill. If I get a you know, if, if I have a, a good flight and the dogs are working well and uh, it's a beautiful day and uh, the, the grouse outfly my bird, that's that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of guys, especially the long winger guys that, you know, just have come to appreciate the flights more than, you know, the amount of game that they take throughout a season and everybody's got their own thing. That's a beautiful thing about falconry and, and other things in life. Everybody's falconry is, is their own and, and what they like is what they like. And that's fine. Yeah. And I certainly admire somebody who can take uh, a wild caught passage exhibitor and turn it into a, a great falconry bird that uh, uh, is, is well adjusted and, and uh, uh, seems to be stress-free. That's amazing. Uh, and I, I wish them well. I just, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's just not your thing. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. There, there's, there's no problem with that whatsoever, but, but yeah, I'm, like I said, I, you know, like I, I really, one of the downsides of doing these podcasts and things with guys like yourself though, is unfortunately it feels like, you know, we could sit here for hours that we don't have probably, and just keep talking about, you know, a lot of these different things and not even come close to covering, you know, a lot of the experiences that you've had in, in you know, 40 plus years or whatever in, in falconry. But we're, we'll probably I think that's probably a good note to to probably end on for for this episode anyway. But I want to go ahead and end like I have been with a lot of guests recently and just kind of get your general take as far as what well, you think a good piece of advice or uh, sentiment to pass on to either aspiring falconers or even current falconers as far as you know just one of the best pieces of advice you could pass along and uh, you know what what that would be well i would give the advice that tom smith gave to ed pitcher judicious use of bagged quarry can make or break a bird i always have bagged quarry with me if i'm flying on my home territory. The only time I don't have uh, a bag with me um, is when I'm off uh, uh, in some other uh, area on at a field meet or, or something where it's difficult to, to bring Huns along. And, and we're using Huns now for our bag quarry. And Tom Smith said, I mean, 
his method of, of training his goshawks was to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. And he says, you know, you've got this bird and things are not going well, but uh, all of a sudden you're in a situation where uh, everything kind of presents itself right. And he says, at that moment, I don't care if I've got wild quarry out there with a dog on point or anything like that. If everything is, is going there, I want that bird to make a kill and I serve it in my bag. I use bag quarry. Doesn't matter how long I've been flying a bird. I use it because I want my bird to know that every time I put it in the air, I will provide quarry. That's my backup. If I cannot provide wild quarry, uh, let's say I've, I've been looking and I haven't you know, bumped any coveys of huns or grouse. Uh, I, I'll go to a place where I expect I've got a fair chance, maybe better than 50-50, of finding quarry if my bird is steady enough. And my birds are steady because of my use of bag quarry in my mind. So I'll put the bird in the air, start working the dogs. If we get a point and a flush, that's great. If doesn't kill and then goes climbing back up and I can't flush a second bird, I'll offer it the bag. If it doesn't climb back up and it's just coming around, I'll throw out. I always have a, a, a dead bag as well. And uh, I don't use a lure anymore. I just, all I use is dead quarry. I throw the dead quarry out and the bird comes into that. I let it pluck a bit and whatnot and, and then pick up. So I, I would say my advice to anyone flying a long wing, at least, and I can't speak to other types of falconry, but flying a long wing on, on upland game, especially where you're very often in a situation where it's not like you've got ducks on a pond, and I know they're there. Uh, you're flying more on speculation. Have that bag and use it when your bird is doing what you want it to do. If it goes up 600, 1,000 feet and uh, you can't produce quarry, wild quarry, you've got the bag and you serve the bird. If you serve the bird consistently, and it can count on you, you'll have a bird that's steady, rock steady, and can stay in the air for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it takes to find quarry. And if by that time, you know, you, you run out of space or, or time or patience, you can serve it. So, and I, I realize that, uh, especially in, in Europe, uh, you know, Bag quarry is looked down upon uh, terribly. Uh, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why it's illegal in some places to serve quarry from the hand for your falcon to kill while it's okay to pull their head off and feed it to your falcon. Uh, seems like it's a lot fairer to give them a chance <laughs> to fly away. But you have to have good bagged quarry. It has to be strong. It has to be it's got to be good, but catchable. Gotcha. And for me, that's uh, more than almost anything else. Once I've gone through the four-week window, uh, what I think uh, provides me with a steady, consistent, highly successful game hawk. Well, like I said, I, I appreciate you being so transparent with with all of us throughout this conversation, and and. Um, you know, like I said, it's always refreshing, I think, to to not only hear, you know, guys that, you know, are, are transparent, but also, you know, are, are humble and also are just very outward with, you know, thinking that, hey, you know, I, I you know, it's kind of like your sentiment saying, you know, you're not, you know, you don't think you're a very good falconer and, and things like that. It's, just, you know, you don't hear things like that very often. You know, it's it's always interesting to to hear guys takes on on themselves and stuff, too. And, you know, like I said, it's it's always refreshing to kind of, you know, hear people just be that, you know, blatantly honest with themselves and stuff, too, and what they <laughs> so I appreciate you. And, and I appreciate you taking the the time and uh, and kind of doing this with us today. And, um, you know, real quick before we do end this 
And um, I'll, I'll have you go ahead and stay with me even whenever I end this recording too, by the way, for just a minute. But uh, before we do end this, uh, tell people how they can get your book if they're interested in it. And um, and we'll go ahead and call this good. Well, the, the original book was uh, The Four-Week Window, just called The Four-Week Window. It was just a little spiral bomb book. I found that uh, I had left out too many things in it, too many details. And so uh, I expanded it and asked other people who had uh, attempted uh, the process uh, to write chapters for it. And it's called Developing the Modern Game Hawk. It's available on our website, prairieskyfalcons.com, which may stay uh, uh, available that way for, for some time, but also certainly available uh, at uh, most North American uh, uh, falconry supply houses. It's, it's not meant to be a, a great picture book. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty much just packed with uh, my ideas in terms of how to raise a, a bird. I, I guess it's a little over 160 pages. Um, and it, it's not about hunting. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's more of a... Uh, uh, how to... How to develop uh, a, a bird as opposed to how to to, to train uh, a bird and understanding the bird's mentality and developmental process uh, rather than, you know, you're not going to learn how to how to make jesses in this book, right? <laughs> For sure. Well, and that's fine. I mean, not every book is is oriented towards the very, very beginner and nor should they be either. So. I appreciate you so much for, for taking the time and hopefully we can do this again sometime and and maybe in person. I mean, we'll, we'll see how things go down the road. Yeah. Well, it's it's great to be interviewed by somebody that knows something about falconry. So you ask great questions and, (laughs) you know, all the difference, right? Well, I, like I said, I appreciate it, Lynn. And, um, you know, I I do my best, but, uh, (laughs) but like I said, anyway, I I appreciate you taking the time. And like I said, go ahead and stay on here for a minute, but, uh, like we'll go ahead and end it and, uh, we'll talk again soon. 